Hi, and welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures as we continue to begin to understand how a laser works. Uh, just to review again, as we always do, um, in order of how we covered things, we talked about laser beams and how they propagated in the Gaussian form of that. Um, we talked about how we can design a stable cavity, how a Gaussian beam is formed by a cavity. We also talked about longitudinal modes, how the reflection between these mirrors forms a lot of very narrow frequencies. And rather than put an X through that, I'm going to put a star by that because we're going to return and that's going to come back to haunt us later on today. And right now we're talking about the gain medium. We're beginning to understand the interaction of the solid material composed of atoms that have distinct energy levels with light. And we're developing a set of equations, and like all engineers, we go through some pretty complex physical stuff and mathematical understanding to derive equations we can work with that let us design things. And we'll be reviewing some of this today and working towards a set of equations we can really work with to design a laser. So just to review really quickly, we have our picture of the Bohr atom, and we know that our Bohr atom goes along, and we represent our Bohr atom, um, and our material, of course, is composed of a lot of atoms, and the interaction of light with the atoms, or interaction of light with the material composed of atoms is what we're really striving to understand here. And we know that the highest populated level uh, we call level zero because we can't rip the electrons off the inner shells, and so on and so forth, and we define energy levels for this atom, and we represent them this way through a schematic diagram. We've gone through this before. We know if we put an electron in level E1, at some time it may fall back down and emit a photon. We also know that photons can come along and lift electrons from level E0 into E1. And to simplify things, even though we know we have a lot of possible levels, we're only going to consider two today. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's just ignore those levels. Now, the thing we want to focus on today is a concept called line shape. And so let me give you some background. You've gone through this before, but, but we need to see how the mathematics of this sort of affect our derivation of laser equations. And you'll look here that the schematic diagram we've done of our Bohr atom, or how we represent atoms, has energy on the vertical axis, so this is increasing energy. The higher an electron can fall up here, the more potential energy it has, while the horizontal axis is the probability of an electron being in a state. And we know that because atoms see slightly different environments, um, the probability is a function of energy. There's a, a fairly high probability for an electron to be at this energy, and a lower but finite probability to be at that energy, and so forth for all our energy levels. Um, and if we represent these two energy levels this way, and notice that I've, I've gone to a somewhat more complicated diagram where I have energy levels that have different widths to them, um, where here is our, our level zero and here is our level one with slightly different widths, um, that there is a distribution. And you'll also notice that I've renamed my x-axis here. And this is kind of an important point, because if we consider a single atom, this is the probability of an electron falling at a particular energy level, which is zero, of course, at some energy levels. But if we take billions and billions of atoms, as Carl Sagan would say, and put them all together in an actually macroscopic piece of solid, a couple millimeters or centimeters on the side, um, we completely lose track of, of those individual atoms. And though each atom on its own has a probability, the ensemble of atoms, the collection of the ultimate trillions and billions of atoms, essentially says this x-axis becomes the number of states. In other words, there might be 10 to the 14 atoms that you could put an electron in at this energy. There might be 10 to the 15th atoms at this energy that an electron is at that state. So really what we're looking at is the number of states or number of, of, of electrons at this point rather than probabilities. And so we know that we're going to get photon transitions, and we're going to assume that we, we put an electron up here in the upper state. It's up in state 1, and it's going to fall back down to state 0 and emit light through the process of spontaneous emission, or in the previous optics course, we would have called this fluorescence. And if the electron is in a, a level up here, let me go ahead and erase some of this other stuff on here. If an electron happens to be 
at this energy level and falls back down to this energy level, that's a pretty big jump. And the photon that comes out has a lot of energy. And so if we look at the emission of light, if we think of, 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 of millions or billions of atoms having these electrons drop back down and emit photons, and we have some kind of physical device in which we collect a large number of photons and look at the wavelength or energy distribution of the photons, for this transition, that's going to fall down there. And you'll notice that as we go through, this happens to have a longer wavelength or smaller frequency and happens to fall more on the red end of the spectrum, while the transition here that happens from the peak to the peak happens to fall between those two frequencies. And so this distribution of probabilities or number of states, in fact, leads to a distribution of wavelengths. And this distribution of wavelengths, the shape of the light we measure coming out in fluorescence, is called the line shape. And so let's write that down because this is what we need to be talking about today. So that's the line shape. And the line shape essentially is given by the convolution of the probability function of state 0 and state 1 that we're talking about here. And you can do this in terms of energy, you can do it in terms of frequency, or you can do it as a function of wavelength. All these are identical because we're simply expressing the energy of a photon in different ways. But the important thing is the line shape is the convolution of the probability of an electron being in the upper state convolved with the lower state. Um, one other thing I want to quickly point out, although it's not that important, is that we see vertical transitions here. Um, that's just convenient to draw. There's no reason an electron can't go from this energy down to this energy with a diagonal transition. Um, in some things like semiconductors, such states are not possible, such transitions are not possible, but we'll not get into that. But this is possible in this case. And so what we see is the line shape is a convolution of these probabilities and gives us information about the distribution 